Hi, Dr. Osborne here. It's no mystery that a number of the different environmental chemicals can wreak havoc on our health, on our immune system, uh, and just in general on our bodies. So it makes common sense to avoid these as much as we possibly can anyway. But some things that we can do to really go an extra step and pulling some of these plastic chemicals, fungicides, pesticides, and other estrogen-based chemicals out of our environment, out of our lifestyle, number one, we can filter our water. And what I recommend is a whole house water filtering device. This way you're filtering the water that you drink from your faucets, that you use to cook with, that you use to wash your dishes with, but additionally you're filtering the water that you bathe with. And a lot of people don't realize that we can absorb a number of different chemicals through our skin. So if we filter our drinking water but we don't filter our bathing water, we can still get exposure to a number of different volatile organic compounds, pesticides, BPA-like chemicals and other petroleum-based chemicals that mimic the hormone estrogen and contribute to a host of different diseases, including obesity. Additionally, I would recommend that you filter your air, especially if you live in an industrialized city like Houston, which is where I'm at. The chemicals in the air, a number of them are petrochemical-based molecules. Again, they mimic estrogen and they can contribute to hormone disruption and hormone hormone abnormalities that contribute to obesity and cancer and heart disease and a host of other problems. So we want to filter our air in our home. The air in our home is actually more toxic than the air on the highway because we have tighter seals on our windows, tighter seals on our door. So it becomes very, very critical to filter the air that we spend at any rate 8 to 12 hours a day breathing in. The other thing that you want to take note of is Soy is commonly referred to as a health product. A lot of soy proteins, soy bars, soy-based cereals, uh, soy milks, etc. are used uh, as a healthy substitute or healthy alternative. Nothing could be further from the truth. The compounds in soy that have been identified as estrogen-based compounds we know can contribute to obesity. But in addition, genetically mo most soy is genetically modified, and the genetically modified versions of soy are horrendous for health. Yeah, a number of lab studies show liver damage and uh, other hormone disruptions uh, with the use of excessive soy. So soy is one of those foods that I would remove from the diet, especially in the processed forms. If you're doing an organic tofu, that's a little bit different, but as a general rule in the processed forms, we want to avoid that altogether. Now sleep disruption is another thing that affects us and plagues us and can contribute to the obesity epidemic. And so a lot of people because of computers, because of TVs, because of lighting, they stay up later at night. So when the sun goes down, they continue to stay up uh, despite what their body is designed to do, which is or go to bed at, uh, when the sun goes down. So one of the things that you want to make sure that you're doing is you want to make sure that you're trying to go to bed when the sun goes down. Now that's a little bit harder to do in the middle of the winter when it gets dark at 6. So we want to try to stick to the 10 to 2 rule, the 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. rule, meaning we need to be asleep during those hours because those hours have been studied the most aggressively and it's been shown that when we don't sleep during those hours we actually lose our ability to heal and regulate circadian rhythms and therefore it throws off our hormonal clock and that can also contribute to obesity. And then lastly that I want to talk a little bit about the myth that calories in equals calories out. A lot of doctors promote that if you just count your calories you should be able to lose weight. Well Describing the above factors on these new chemicals that we've identified called obesogens, it's obvious that calories in don't equal calories out. If we've got chemicals in our environment that can contribute to hormonal changes that make it more challenging to lose weight, that convert certain cell types in our body to fat cells instead of connective tissue cells, then we have these other issues we have to be concerned with. The first issue is the hormonal effect of food. A number of different foods, when eaten, can trigger an excessive insulin response that leads to hormonal changes that lead to weight gain. So if a person is eating, for example, a common example would be a diabetic who's eating too much sugar and triggering too much insulin, and no matter how little amount of calories a diabetic eats, it's actually going to still lead to weight gain because insulin tells the body to store fat. So even if you ate 100 calories a day, you're still going to store fat if you're overproducing insulin. So it's important to choose foods, one that you're not allergic to, two that are not going to promote a strong insulin response that will lead to hormone disruption and fat storage. 
but it's also important the timing at which you eat. You see above the study that we referenced stated that when people eat late at night when they're supposed to be sleeping, this also has a hormonal influence on fat gain, on weight gain. So we want to make sure that the time frame we're supposed to eat, which is during the day and not in the middle of the night, is adhered to so that we can optimize our weight loss and our weight loss benefits. Below me, you'll see a list of some of these factors that we've just discussed, and there's a few links. So if you're looking uh, for where you can find some of these suggestions that I'm, that I'm giving you, those links should take you to areas where you can find these things. Again, this is Dr. Osborne. I'm wishing you the best health. Have a great day.